Praise the Lord, Sister Jasmine, Sister Locke, Sister LeClaire, everybody else. Thank you so much for being in attendance to Sunday School. If you wouldn't mind, please start making your way to your seats so we can go ahead and get things kicked off and started. So glad to see every one of your smiling faces here today. If you're not smiling, it's still good to see your face, but it'd be even better if I was seeing those pearly whites. So let's all practice right now. Let's just show our Holy Ghost smile. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So for the past several weeks, we have been doing a series about revival. How many know what revival is? Uh, it's one of those church words that people throw around and you're kind of like, if you've never been in church before, you're like, what, what's that? What's revival? What's revival? Uh, I saw a sign for revival down in uh, Elkin and it's actually right by a medical center. So you might think something else hearing that word. Does anybody have an idea as to what revival is in the church sense? Exactly. Thank you, Brother Josh. It's an opportunity for us to revive our spirit. Just like down there, that sign, Revival, was next to a medical center. It's where they literally revived people that were on death's door. So Revival is where we are, where we are spiritually revived, okay? It's, it's where our spirits and our, our relationship with Jesus Christ, which, let's be honest at times, sometimes it grows stagnant, right? Sometimes we have great awesome experiences with God. And then what happens over time, we just start to experience the everyday mundane activities, the endless things to do. And we just start to get, you know, a little comfortable and we, we sit back and all of a sudden it ceases to be as much of a priority. Revival is when that relationship with Jesus Christ becomes the utmost priority once again. Now, a lot of people think revival is uh, when there's, there's a ton of people coming into church and, and they're having these amazing experiences with God. And that is certainly the result of revival, just like, you know, kids are the result of a, of a happy marriage. But that is not necessarily revival. Revival, again, is where our relationship with Jesus Christ is strengthened and encouraged. Now, I'm going to make a statement here. And I if you're taking notes, it's okay if you're not, but if you're taking notes, this would be the part where you write this down, and that is this, God desires revival in every circumstance. Can somebody say every circumstance? Every circumstance. We think sometimes that everything's got to be perfect for God to move. We think that, you know, there, for in, a, in a church service, we're like, well, you know, the music's got to be just right. It can't be too loud. It can't be too quiet. And the speaker's got to have a certain level of charisma and eloquence. And, you know, you need to have all of the, the good looking singers on the platform because, oh, gosh, you know, all those things. I'm just kidding. That's, that's just a joke. That's just it's probably not a very good joke. Y'all know how preachers make jokes and they're not that good. And then, you know, you, you feel obligated to laugh. Well, some of you feel obligated to laugh. Evidently, the others don't. But anyway, we, we feel sometimes as if everything has to be perfect in order for us to experience revival. But it's, it's God's desire that we have a thriving relationship with him in every single circumstance. Amen. Drawing on the marriage metaphor, my relationship with my spouse should be strong for richer or poorer. Amen. And for in sickness and in health, in the good, and in the bad. And similarly, my relationship with Jesus Christ should be strong regardless of the circumstance. If we trust in works, and we trust in that everything being right, I call that perfection. If we trust in perfection, we're not really trusting in God, amen? Somebody say, it doesn't have to be perfect for me to love Jesus. It doesn't have to be perfect for me to love Jesus. Revival can happen in every season and every circumstance. But it's not always easy, right? Because sometimes we have stuff going on. Sometimes someone might be sick. Sometimes we might be a little bit low on the money. Sometimes... Things might not be going perfectly, and in those moments, it's just real easy to get distracted. Has anybody ever read the story of Peter walking on water? 
It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and there's such truth wrapped into it. Jesus, he comes walking to uh, the disciples, and they're in the middle of this storm that Jesus has actually sent them into, and that's kind of crazy when you start to think about it, that God would actually send the disciples into a troubling situation, but, but that's exactly what happens. He sends them into this storm, and they're out there, and they're trying to, to keep their bear. Jesus walking, and, and they get scared. They're so over in circumstances that they don't recognize who Jesus is. But he, the reason, verse it says, all the wind boys and the waves that were distracted the storm. Behavior, and all of a sudden, he starts. That's right. And that goes to show us sometimes, you know, we can be living distracted. And when we take our eyes, not to stink, but to sink. <laughs> God, though, and him back up. And suddenly, if we're going through the situation. My, my point is, revival's possible, but it's, it's not always easy because as human beings, we get distracted by the storm and we get distracted by the waves. But while it's not easy, revival is still possible. It is still possible. Amen. Y'all with me? Y'all tracking? Okay. So, Anyway, that, that brings us to our text, which uh, is the book of Jude. How many have ever read through the book of Jude? If you haven't, I, I, uh, I encourage you to do it. It'll take you about three seconds because the book of Jude is, is one page. Uh, every year here at the sanctuary, we do something called Summer Nights, and we encourage the young people to uh, read books of the Bible, and, and they, they play games, and they compete for these points. And, you know, sometimes I'll have a young person come up to me and be like, it's not fair, they're losing points. And I'm like, well, if you just, you know, read a book of the Bible, and they're like, a whole book, a whole book of the Bible. And then I open the Bible, and I just point to the book of Jude, and I'm like, just, guys, it's a page. It'll take you, like, 30 seconds to read. So that's the, the passage that we're going to be studying here is the book of Jude. It's a very short book. It's actually the second shortest book of the Bible. But just because it's short does not mean it's not powerful. There's a lot of great teaching packed into Jude, and we're going to start unpacking that. So a couple things you should know about Jude and the context that this book was written in. Uh, Jude was actually the half-brother of of Jesus, and he was known as Judas, but you know, after that unfortunate incident in the Garden of Gethsemane, you didn't really want to be known as Judas after there, so they changed his name in the KJV to Jude, okay? So Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, and he saw the church of the first century rise, fall, endure, overcome. He was there when Jerusalem fell to the Romans. He was there when there was persecution taking place by the Sanhedrin. He was there when the Christians were being tossed to the lions, and he was seeing all of this different stuff. And the crazy thing was that throughout all of this persecution, the church continued to thrive. We think sometimes, like I said, that we need a perfect situation to have revival. And yet here, you had different people that were being killed and tossed to lions and all these crazy things. And yet, they were growing in God and they were walking with God. So anyway, Jude, he sees this stuff and he's, he's nearing the end of his life. And he begins to notice some troubling things going on in the church. Some stuff that, uh, oh, I don't, I don't know about this. Because before, there were these attacks from without. There was persecution taking place, but the church was growing stronger and getting closer to one another. But now, all of a sudden, there's a different threat. Somebody say a different threat. It's not an attack from without, but it's an attack from within. There are these false teachers that are starting to enter into the church and spread doctrine and, and teachings and stuff that, that is very contrary to the word of God. And I'm just going to name three that I, I know about at the time. The first was a group of people called the Gnostics. Does anybody know what the Gnostics were? 
The Gnostics were a group of people that taught that salvation wasn't just attained by having a relationship with Jesus Christ and obeying the gospel. They believed that you had to have extra super secret spiritual knowledge to truly be saved. And they taught it was a it was influenced by Greek philosophy. They taught that Jesus wasn't really God, that he was just an imperfect emanation of God. They taught all of these different things that, that were incorrect and, and wrong. There was the Nicolaitans. They were uh, another group of people that came in, and we can see this still today, this same trend. They were the people that said, well, you could be saved, but you can live however you want. In fact, a popular saying of theirs was recorded in the book of Revelation. It was basically, hey, in order to overcome sin, you need to know sin. So go out and sin and have a great time and come back and we'll pray through and be okay. That's false doctrine, church. We can't just do that. We can't just live. I mean, we, we can. Jesus Christ sets you free from sin. But it's like, well, okay, I guess I can go back after God has delivered me from the cigarette to, to, to smoking again. But I'm just putting myself right back into that same pit and that same problem. Y'all see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a false doctrine. There was the Judaizers who were saying, hey, you shouldn't just trust in God's grace. But you need to follow all the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament to be right. So you had some people that said you need more knowledge to be saved. You had some people that said, hey, you can do whatever you want and remain saved. You had some people that said, hey, God's grace isn't sufficient. You need to start trusting in your own works to be saved. There's all of these different false teachers and these babbling voices. And have, how many of you ever heard several people talking at once? You know, I, I, love, I love my family. How many love their family? I grew up in a very loving, wonderful, uh, encouraging home. Uh, it was very boisterous, very loud. I remember the first time uh, my wife came with me to eat dinner with my family, and I just thought this was normal, but one of the things that happens in my family at dinner is that everybody talks at once. Everybody says something here, and then somebody says something there, and there's two or three conversations going on, and while that's happening, somebody else is like, hey, can you pass the butter? I need to butter this roll, and it's, I, I thrive in it. I like chaos. I'm a sanguine. I love the energy and all the conversation and stuff, but we got done, and my wife grew up in a, in a family that, you know, you sit around the table, and you eat the food, and you're quiet, or maybe one or two people are talking, and then everything is, uh, you know, good, so we got done, and she was like, wow, that was a that was a lot of conversation. That was a lot of conversation. There's, how many of you guys have ever been at a, at a family, social, or a situation where you heard several people talking at once? Brother Hogue is raising both hands. I don't know why. <laughs> it just sounds like he has a story. So It's, yeah, okay, he always has a story. Thank you, Brother Eric. Thank you, Brother Eric. It's confusing. You get distracted. You know, now that I've started living on my own and, and I eat dinner with my wife and there's just her and me and it's just her and me talking, I go back and I have dinner with my family and I'm like, wow, there's so many conversations. It's great, but it's like, ooh, it's, 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 it's discombobulating, you know? It, all of those different voices talking can create confusion. And that's an accurate picture of what's going on in the church during the day of Jude. You had one person saying this thing and another person saying another thing and all of this different stuff going on, all of these different false teachers teaching different doctrines, but they all had one thing in common, one thing in common, and we read about it in Jude, and I'm just going to summarize a lot of this until we get to the meat of the passage that we're going to study today. They start rejecting godly authority. They refuse to abide by what the Bible teaches and what the church leaders were teaching as well. It's one of the reasons why we, we have pastors, okay? Which, by, for your information, is another word for shepherd. Because when it's just me, when I am my own authority in my life, it's really easy to justify sin. It's really easy when I am the highest authority to put the rubber stamp of approval. It's easy to kill the conscience and, and give in to my baser desires and justify sin. Thank God for a shepherd. Thank God for a pastor who's not afraid to tell the truth. I'm going to make a statement here, and this isn't even my, my lesson, but it's something that we should know, and it's something that we should apply to our lives. I am never so spiritual 
I am never, I never get to the point, we will never get to the point while we have flesh where we don't need somebody else who can speak for God in our life. You never get to the point because of your flesh where you, you don't need anybody else to be the voice of God in your life, where you don't need a pastor, where you don't need a shepherd because we are all subject to this flesh. And the Bible says that there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. When I'm living off of my own desires and I'm living off of what I think is right and nobody else can tell me that I'm wrong, if there's nobody else in my life that I look to that I, I, I trust in and I respect enough to say, hey, you're wrong, this area in your life needs to change, then you know what? The, the Bible says at the end of that is death. All of these false teachers, they're, they, they're teaching lots of different doctrines, but they all have this one common uh, aspect about them, and that's that they're like, you know, we're just gonna, we're not gonna listen to them. We're not gonna li listen to them. There are these false teachers. They're, they're creeping into the church during the time of Jude. And Jude, he's not having any of it. If you've ever read the book of Jude, he's, he's pretty savage in denouncing these people. He compares them to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, you guys are like trees with no roots. You guys are like stars that just wander around. You're like waves that just have foam. You're like clouds without water. You're, you're an image without substance. You have no power. You have nothing in you. Jude, Jude was not politically correct, just so you know. So Jude is addressing this problem in the church and you get the impression from his book that the church is just full of all of these false teachers. The church is full of these people that are bringing in false doctrine. It's not exactly ideal conditions for a mighty move of God, right? Or at least that's what we think. We got all these people that are teaching different stuff and nobody's agreeing with anybody. And I know Jude is saying this thing, but this other guy over here is saying that thing. And what do we do? What do we do? And I'm sure there were some sincere believers at the time who Jude was writing to who were just wringing their hands and going, oh no, what are we gonna do? So and so is not living for God and it's really terrible. And Sister Susie Floozy's over there leading people astray. What are we gonna do? Oh, I don't know what to do. And Jude writes the letter. He writes this letter where he's, he's like, yeah, yeah, guys, look, it's, it's bad. It's bad. They shouldn't be teaching that stuff. It's bad. They're wrong. But y'all remember what Jesus said? This is Jude chapter uh, 1. There's only one chapter, so just Jude 17 to 20, okay? He says this, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, guys, remember what Jesus said? They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. He says, hey, the apostles, Jesus, they all said this was going to happen. In the last days, people were going to persecute you. In the last days, there were going to be wolves that come into the flock, and they're going to try to lead people astray. He says it's going to happen. Somebody say it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It just it happens because that's human nature. But then Jude makes this statement in verse 20 to 21. He, he outlines the problem in uh, verses 1 to about 16, and, and then he says, hey guys, remember, this, is, this was supposed to happen. God's not surprised when bad stuff happens. God's not surprised when issues arise. God's not surprised when we, we have tribulation and trouble and, and trial and all these things. He already has a plan. Does that give you hope? Because that gives me hope. Even when bad stuff happens and, and, and dark stuff goes down, God is still in control. He knows the end from the beginning. He's got this. He says, guys, God, God knows about this, okay? And then he tells them what they are to do about it, okay? This is verse 20 to 21, all right? He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to everlasting life or eternal life. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. They're like, Jude, what do we do? Oh, the, all these bad things are happening in the church. What do we do? We don't know what to do. 
what? And Jews like, hey, 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 it's, it's okay, it's okay. Well, it's not okay, it's bad, it's bad. But, but this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Just trust God. And, and here's what you need to do, okay? Don't get worked up in a tizzy. Don't get upset. Don't start doubting. Don't let it shake you up. This is going to happen. Keep yourself in the love of God, waiting on the mercy of the Lord. But Jude, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we do something about this? Shouldn't we confront this problem? And, you know, and Jude's like, well, hey, I'm doing that. But you know what your job is? Hey, your job is to keep yourself in the love of God. Jude, what do I do when, when all this stuff breaks out in my life and I've got problems and, and issues going on? And Jude says, keep yourself in the love of God of God. Jude, what do I do when, when so-and-so gets sick and, and I, I'm praying and it seems like God isn't hearing me? You keep yourself in the love of God. What do I do when this person decides that they're not going to be living for God? You keep yourself in the love of God. What do I do when I don't seem to have any money to pay my bills? You keep yourself in the love of God. Jude's answer here is the same. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Abide in Jesus. Keep yourself in the love of God. Now this phrase has two applications, okay? We think sometimes that we got to be the savior. We got to be the one that fixes all of the issues in our life. And, and when we can't do it, we go to God. And when he doesn't do it, we're like, what are we supposed to do? And, and Jude says, and I'm just going to say it again because I, I want us to get it. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You keep yourself in the love of God by allowing the love of God to flow into you and through you. Did you know you are the object of God's everlasting, undying love? If you were the only person that ever accepted his grace and obeyed the gospel and gave yourself to him, Jesus Christ, while he's hanging up there on that crucifix, bleeding his guts out, would have still said, you are worth it. I'd do it for one of you. You are the object of God's eternal and undying love. And, and that's just a knowledge that we got to rest in, church. That's the knowledge that we got to abide in. When that stuff happens, when I mess up, it's, you know, it's good actually sometimes to mess up if we come back to God. Because what that does is that teaches me, you know what, I'm really not all that in a bag of chips. You can still keep yourself in the love of God by understanding even when you mess up. Oh, God loves me. I can come back to him and I can repent and I can surrender these things. You are the object of God's undying devotion. The love of God is meant to flow into you. But it's not just meant to flow into you. It's meant to flow through you. You keep yourself in the love of God, not just by receiving the love of God, but by letting it flow through you. Anybody ever filled up a water balloon? What happens if you don't take that water balloon off the spigot? Busts. There's got to be an outlet. It's the same for us, guys. We can't just continue to take in the love of God and take in the love of God. We got to let it flow through us. In fact, the love of God is meant to, to, to be uh, extended into other people's lives. We are meant to be not just the object of his love, but the conduit. One of my testimonies, I got a lot of them. I got a lot of testimonies, y'all. God's just, he puts up with a lot of junk in me, and I'm thankful to God for it. But one of the things that I'm really thankful to God is, uh, is he actually, he delivered me out of insecurity when I, uh, when I moved here to Mount Airy. And he, from the, the outside looking in, if you looked at me, you probably would have thought, oh, this is somebody that's confident. This is somebody that seems to have it all together. You know, he's happy. He goes up and talks to people. He's super bold. But truthfully, on the inside, I was terrified of what other people thought of me. And I struggled with a lot of fear. And, and I didn't get it because, you know, I grew up in a loving home. And I grew up in church. And I had the Holy Ghost. And I baptized in the name of Jesus, and I had these amazing experiences with God, and I was like, well, why am I still struggling with insecurity? I mean, when I read the Bible, it says perfect love casts out all fear, right? 
So if I'm perfectly loved by God, then, then why am I still struggling with fear? And I remember I used to ask the question when I was in youth group. I'd be like, would people even notice if I didn't show up here today? I, I don't know. And I'd just sit back and I'd wait for others to come up and talk to me. And when they didn't, I'd get all upset and all these things and maybe a little bit offended. And I just struggled. I just struggled. I don't get it, God. Why can't I walk in the freedom of abundant life? You know, I came here and God started to speak to me. And one of the things he said is, Josh, you know, church is not about who misses you when you're gone. It's about who you missed. It's not about you. It's not about, you know, what I can do for you and whether or not other people notice you. It's about whether or not you notice other people. What am I saying here? I'm saying that in order for us to walk in freedom, we cannot just be perfectly loved. We have to love others. That's how perfect love casts out fear. When I decide, you know what, despite my fears and my insecurities, I'm still going to love people and not just allow the love of God to flow into me, but I'm going to allow the love of God to flow through me. I'm not just going to be the object of his love. I'm going to be the conduit. And you know, when I made that decision and I decided, you know, it's not all about me. I'm just going to forget myself. I'm going to take this old flesh. I'm going to leave it on the altar every day. And I'm going to go start talking to people and just letting them know, hey, I love you. I love you. I'm here for you. When I started to do that, you know what the crazy thing was, Sister LeClaire? That fear and that insecurity and that worry about what other people thought about me was gone because me had died at the altar. Me had been laid down. We're not just meant to be the object of God's love. We're meant to be the conduit. We're meant to be the thing that allows him to flow through us. We are meant to share and show the love of God to each other. Jude, what do we do? All this bad stuff's going down, Jude. Keep yourself in the love of God. By receiving God's love and sharing God's love. Now, that's, that's a nice little phrase, right? Keep yourself in the love of God. But how exactly do I do that? Well, Jude, because Jude's a practical guy, he's one of those old school teachers, he actually breaks it down for us in verses 22 to 23. So let's go ahead and let's read that. Jude chapter 22 to 23, okay? Okay. Uh, can you go uh, to 21? Okay, go to 22. I'll go to 23. Thanks. Okay, so go back to 22. That was different than the uh, version I was reading. I'm going to read it in mine too, okay? So it says, and of some having compassion, making a difference, okay? And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted with flesh. Would you guys give me just a sec here? Let me come back, okay? This is what he says. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, okay? And a couple other translations read this way. It says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. In these verses, Jude is talking about how to, what was the phrase again, Brother Eric? No, 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 earlier. Keep yourself, keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. And in this situation, he's talking about four uh, separate people here. There's four kinds of people, and there's three responses for the faithful believer. The first kinds of people that are, uh, he's speaking to in this verse are the faithful believers. And he's, he's admonishing them to keep themselves in the love of God. And he says, when you keep yourself in the love of God, uh, there's three kinds of people that you're going to be ministering to or reaching out to. Number one was those that need mercy, okay? Number two is those that need mercy pursuing. And number three is those that need truth. He's given three principles here on how to keep yourself in the love of God. He says you need to be showing mercy to those that, you know, doubt, 
to those that struggle. He says you need to be chasing after people that are, are, are over by the fire. You need to be reaching out to people, pulling them away from that. And there's going to be some times where you have to be honest and just tell somebody, hey, that's wrong. I love you, but that sin right there is ruining your life. He says, hey, have mercy on those that doubt. Snatch people out of the fire. Have mercy on those. Oh, goodness, let me find that verse again. Could you pull up 23 again, PJ? He says, have mercy on, on others, hating even the garment spotted by flesh. So we're going to break that down, okay? We're going to look at these uh, three different, three guiding principles, okay? So the first group of people he's talking about, those who doubt. So Jude is referencing a specific group of people here. New believers were coming into the church, and they were hearing something from one person and something else from another. And what was happening is they were beginning to question their faith. They were beginning to question, is this really true? Is this really right? I don't know. I'm confused. Okay, they were beginning to doubt. And, and you know, sometimes I, I know some, some people some, nobody in here, nobody in here at all, nobody in this church, okay? But I know some people that if you were to express a doubt to them or some confusion over something, they'd take the self-righteous hammer and just crush you on the head and be like, well, the Bible says this, blah, blah, blah. Jude says, don't do that, okay? Jude says, show mercy to them. He says, be kind to them. Dirty little secret is, sometimes as Christians, we all struggle with doubt, right? Because we're flesh. We all struggle or have struggled or will struggle with doubt. It's human nature to, to ask questions. And really, doubt uh, in itself is um, it's a strength and excess, it's not a bad thing to ask questions. It's not a bad thing to be, you know, inquisitive, to be curious, to, to test things out. But where it becomes sin is not just where I'm asking God's questions, but I'm, or asking God questions, but I'm beginning to question God. Okay, it's, it's a weakness. It's, it's a strength in excess, okay? It's human nature to ask questions, okay? So I'm going to make a statement here for this, just to help you guys out, because this has helped me out in the past. Faith is not the absence of doubt. The Bible talks all the time about faith. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the ability to overcome your doubt through trust in God. It's like, hey, Brother Eric, could I use you for a sec? Could I use you for a sec? Come on up. Come on up here. Would you stand on this platform? Actually, come on back down here. Come on, it's okay. I'm kind of scared. I won't be able to catch you. Okay, turn around. Turn around. You guys ever done a trust fall? Ever done a trust fall? Okay. All right. So I want you to just uh, trust fall. We all struggle with doubt. Okay. So hold on. Hold on. Hey, come back up here. I need your help. I need your help. Okay. I caught you, right? I caught you, right? Okay. Do you trust me? All right, well, let's do it again. Let's do it again. There you go. All right, let's all give him a round of applause. Did y'all notice the difference between the two there? First time, oh, I'm kind of scared he's not going to catch me, but I did. And so the second time, he was more able to trust me. It's the same with God. We all struggle with doubt. Doubt or, or faith is not the absence of that doubt. Faith is saying, you know what? I know this time God is going to catch me. I know this time that God is going to come through. Did you know that struggling with doubt can actually bring you closer to God? The times in my life when I had questions, real honest questions for God, and I went to him with those questions were the times that God brought me closer. A great example was in high, in, in high school. My dad, he's going through one right now, but back in high school, he was going through a major medical crisis, and truthfully, I thought he was gonna die. I remember going in uh, to the, the hospital room one Wednesday night, seeing the IV lines all hooked up to him, and I was like, man, 
God, are, are you really that good? Is God really that good? I mean, here's my dad who's been serving God this whole time, and he's laying out on this hospital bed, and, and, and I just don't get it. And I went into youth class that night, and I was just wrestling with that question. Y'all ever wrestle with those real questions where you're like, man, is God really that good, or is God really able to help me this time, or is God really able to come through this time? And, and I was just, you know, I, I went to the altar that night with that question, and I was like, all right, this is the last time I'm going to pray. This is the last time I'm going to seek God, because I'm, I'm just up said about this. I don't, I don't know. And the thing is, is God answered my question with one of his own. He said, hey, are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to take a leap of faith? And you know, that night I answered, yes, I really gave my life to God that night. And, and God answered that prayer, and, and God actually did heal my father. And it's not necessarily that he needed to heal my father to be good, because my father, he, you know, he's, he's been rescued, he's saved. And so if he passes, he's going to go on to eternity, he's going to be saved. But what I know from that experience and what I learned in that moment was that God is good. It's okay to go to God with those questions. It's okay to come to him. It's okay to have that struggle with doubt if it winds up bringing you closer to him. Faith isn't the absence of doubt. It's the ability to overcome it. And we all go through times of doubt. Therefore, Jude says this, we ought to be kind when people struggle with it. And really, that applies to pretty much every problem out there. You know, we all struggle with fear. We ought to be kind to people that struggle with fear. We all struggle with pride. You know, we got to be graceful to people with pride. In fact, if you come against somebody with pride, with some pride of your own, all it's going to do is make you both angry and walk away. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. We got to be kind in those moments. Jude here is saying, hey, you got to continue in God's love. And the first way you do that is by being kind to people who struggle. It's not in judging them. It's not in taking the Bible and bashing them over the head. It's saying, you know what? Hey, I love you. I get it. I've been there. I, I understand. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. Continue in God's love. Don't judge them. Love them. Don't make people feel bad about the struggle. Help them, help them overcome it. Be that voice of faith. Be that encouraging friend. Be that person that does just a little act of kindness that, that changes their day or their life. Not only does Jude say, be kind to those who doubt, he also says, snatch him out of the fire. Someone say, snatch him out of the fire. He said, and, and he, the image that conjures really is, you know, Jude's not over here and the fire's over there. It's Jude going up to the place where there the fire is and grabbing people and pulling them up and snatching them away from that problem, pulling them away from the fire. He's saying, go snatch people out of the fire. Church, we can't wait for the lost to come to us. We have to go to them. We, it's it's kind of like, you know, and this happens in church. It's just how it is. We, we get comfortable, okay? And we forget that right outside these walls, there's, there's this burning building, okay? And it's, it's kind of like, well, we're just, we're just waiting here. And, you know, we're, we're standing up here where it's safe. And we see the burning building over there. And we're shouting, hey, the building's on fire. You need to get out of that place. Does that do anybody one bit of good? No, 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 no. The thing that we are called to do is to go down to that burning building and find people that need help and pick them up and carry them out. We got to snatch them out of the fire. Sometimes that means going through extraordinary measures to reach somebody. I had a, uh, a friend of mine recently tell me a story about a time he went through an extraordinary measure. He, uh, he's a leader at another church. And um, there was somebody that was actually, he was using and utilizing in, in ministry. And they just, they were having a hard time, Sister Brianna. They were just going through like the worst time of their life. Their car was impounded. They had student debt through the roof. Their credit bills were coming due, all of these problems. And I mean, you could argue, well, some of that, you know, was, was their fault. And they got themselves into that situation. Is that being kind? 
No, 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 it's not being kind. But anyway, this person here, you know, they're just going through this stuff. And, and sadly, they started to allow it to spill into their conversation and their conduct. And they started to treat other people in an unkind manner and an unkind way. And my friend, he was telling me, he was like, you know, that first time they did it, I was like, it's okay. And that second time they did it, I was like, it's all right. And by that third time, I was like, okay, well, listen, I, I love you, but you, you got to step down from this position because you're not doing any good. And that person got all mad and was like, you know what? I'm never coming back to this church again. And they stormed out of those doors and they ran to their car. Now, my friend, he was like, in that moment, the last thing I wanted to do, the last thing I wanted to do was go after them because they hurt my feelings. They called me names. They were rude. But you know what I did? I, I, God, God spoke to me and said, you know, you need to go after them. And so I did. I ran out to their car and, and they, they were getting in and, and or they were, yeah, they were getting in. And I actually, before they could get in, I, I, I went in and I got in the car too and I refused to get out. Now, I'm not recommending you do this, okay, because it's different for every, different, every situation. All right, he was following the leading of the Holy Ghost. What I'm saying is sometimes we have to go through extraordinary measures to reach people. Anyway, this person, they're like, get out of my car. And he's like, no, I'm not going to get out of your car. I, I love you too much to let you just walk out of this place without me having done everything possible to reach them. And that person, they started to call them names. They, were, they started to say all kinds of awful things. You're, you're racist. You're, 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 you're just in here because of this. You're trying to look good. You know, all kinds of awful things. And here's my friend trying to reach out to this person and, and pull them back and pull them back. And, 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 and he just won't get out of the car. He will not get out of the car because God has told him to stay in there. And he's like, I got to stay. Listen, listen, this, this is, and, and, and finally, this other person gets done saying all these mean things and these awful things. And, and my friend's like, you know what? I tell you what, I want you to know this here. I love you, okay? I love you so much that I'm willing to do something here to show you that you're wrong about me. Okay, and this person actually, uh, they, they owed some money, about $200 worth on something. And he pulled it out of his wallet and he gave it to them. And I want you to know here, he said this that I love you. And in that moment, you know what happened? That person just busted out in tears and began to cry and apologize. I'm sorry. And they haven't missed church since then. Church, sometimes we gotta go through extraordinary measures to reach people. It seems like a lot until you realize that that person is Someone's sister, someone's brother. If your kid was in the hospital, you'd empty your bank account for him, right? Because you'll love them. And you'll do whatever it takes to reach them. There's a story in the Bible about four young men who loved their friends so much that they were willing to carry him up to a roof and tear that sucker off and drop him down just to get him close enough to Jesus that he might be healed. And church, that is, that is what we are called to do. We can't just stay in this building looking out at the fire out there and say, hey, it's on fire. You need to come in here. No, 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 no. If we are to truly, what, what was the statement again, Brother Eric? Keep ourselves in the love of God. If we are truly to keep ourselves in the love of God, then we can't stay here. We got to go out there. We got to start reaching people and bringing them in and pulling them here. Whatever we got to do. Whatever I got to do. Sometimes we get so caught up in the drama here that we forget that there's a lost world out there full of hungry people. So Jude, he says, if you're going to keep yourself in the love of God, you need to be kind to others. Don't judge him. He says, you need to snatch him out of the fire. And he makes one more statement. And I'm going to, we're running real short on time. So I'm just going to go ahead and summarize this up here, okay? He says, not only do you need to be kind, not only do you need to be pursuing people and pulling them in, he says, show other people mercy mixed with fear hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, what does that mean in contemporary English? What does it mean? He says fear. He's saying it means that while I love people, and this is so important that we get because this is essential to the love of God. While I love 
people with every drop in me, with every drop in my body. I should never allow that love for others to compromise the truth. Because that's a very scary thing. We cannot afford to compromise the truth because the truth is all we got. What do I mean? I mean treating sin like it's no big deal. Acting like, you know, it'll be all right. You don't got to change your life to be right with Jesus. You know, we we got to understand this, y'all. Jesus loves sinners, but he hates sin. He hates sin because of what it does to us, what it does to others, what it does to the world. He loves people, but he hates sin. And someday, we got to remember this, he is going to judge sin. And I am not doing people any favors by pretending like that problem or that sin is no big deal when someday those, some, those same people will stand before God and find out that it really was. Judas is creating this picture. He says, hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. He says, sin is, sin is horrendous to God. It's, 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 it, it disgusts him. And while he loves people with everything he's got, and he hates what it does to them. There's a proverb. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. If we truly love people, we got to tell them the truth. And we want to do it without judgment. We want to do it in love, with grace and mercy. And there's a principle that says, you know, you, uh, you can, <clears throat> you want to put corn in the crib before you speak into people's lives. You want to show them that you love them before you start preaching at them or anything like that, okay? We want to preach the truth, share the truth without love or with love and in grace and in mercy, but they've got to know, church, they've got to know that heaven's real, that hell's real, that someday God is going to judge every single soul for their sin, and the only way out is through Jesus, and that's where revival starts, when we choose to show mercy when we start loving people the way Jesus loves and chasing the people Jesus chases, and, and, and we we're not afraid to tell the truth. So I just want to encourage us here, this little bit of teaching in Jude. Let's all stand. We're about done. What does Jude say in the face of all of those problems in Jude? He says, keep yourself in the love of God. And you keep yourself in the love of God by being kind, by chasing after people. but also by telling the truth. I just want to encourage us this week, this week, do that. Apply those scriptures to your life. Let's continue in the love of God. Let's bow our heads and pray right now. Abba, we thank you so much for this time we've had to study your word. I pray that you would just help us all to draw closer to you. Help us, oh Lord, to keep ourselves in your love. Help us, oh Lord, to be kind to those that doubt, those that struggle. Help us, oh Lord, to chase after people, to snatch them out of the fire, and help us, God, to never compromise the truth of what your word says, oh Lord. Help us instead to cling to this and to cling to you and to love people with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's it for Sunday School.